Good evening, everyone. Welcome you all to another wonderful session of Oncology Classroom. Today evening, we are delighted to have Dr. P. Bijay Anandradi, sir, who is the director of Apollo Cancer Institute, Hyderabad. He is not only an acclaimed oncologist in this country, but he has been revered for his excellent academic acumen, research skill, and oration skill across the globe. It's my honor to have said today in this session of retinoblastoma, current concepts of management. No talk on ocular oncology can be complete without him, as he has immense contribution in this country behind ocular oncology. He has also been part of the American Brachytherapy Society for Ocular Oncology Services, and he has been one of the collaborators for the same. And he has a lot of seminal work on this field, a lot of publications in this field. Sir has also been the president of Association of Radiation Oncologists of India, which is the largest body of oncologists in this country. Welcome you, sir, to this wonderful session. And we are really thankful to you to have you here. It's our privilege that you agreed to take this session. I request you to take over the session now and start your lecture. Thank you for being with us. Good to see you, uh, Srinivasan, and many other uh, students. Uh, always smiling, guys. Srinivasan, nice to see you, guys. You've Thank been you. Very active in the ECRO, and I'm so glad that you are leading the ECRO in such a rightful way. Um, Thank right, you. We had um, uh, several uh, sessions. I wonder and congratulate uh, Doodle for doing this wonderful uh, class sessions uh, across the, apart from so many CME programs that we have, the ARO is organizing, but still uh, the, this class uh, definitely certainly helps the younger generation. Uh, now we have growing number of uh, PG students across the country. So NB, DNB, so, uh, so many DNB and MD students. I'm sure um, they would uh, get benefited with these wonderful classes uh, that uh, Dodal is arranged. And I am happy to tell you that uh, uh, Dodal is uh, re recording these things and he's putting on the YouTube. And whoever misses this, and you can ask your colleagues to uh, check the YouTube at a later date uh, to see if they have missed for some reason uh, these classes. So without much ado, uh, briefly, uh, last time we had a good uh, session on uh, brachy uh, in uh, role of brachytherapy in ocular tumors. So in continuation of that, uh, we will be talking about retinoblastoma, uh, which normally in uh, most of your centers, uh, I'm sure you hardly see such cases. And when they are referred to you for any kind of a treatment, then uh, most of the uh, people, they get puzzled, they get confused what to do, how to do how to treat these ocular tumors uh, because the experience of even the seniors in the institutes have been uh, very, very meager. So it becomes difficult. And uh, these days we should be ready with this uh, information and how to deal with this kind of tumors. Uh, uh, so we, uh, it's good that we have these kind of classes also apart from the common cancers like head and neck and carcinoma, cervix and rectum. So, Let's start with uh, uh, today's class. Uh, uh, so briefly on this, uh, <clears throat> the burden, uh, the global burden of the disease is around two to four of all two to four percent of the childhood malignancies that you see. Uh, should I minimize this uh, screen. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, I can push this away so that. All right. Thank you. Uh, now, the Indian uh, is certainly little more than the global uh, disease burden. It falls around 5 to 7 percent of the childhood malignancies. And again, the incidence also, if you look at uh, 2 to 5 cases per million under the age of 5 years globally, whereas in India, it's almost 10 cases per million uh, below the age group of 4. So, on an average of 1 in 15,000 cases of live births, you find retinoblastoma. This is our own uh, data. That's what we see. Uh, okay. Now, <clears throat> the again, Indian incidence uh, around 1,500 to 2,000 cases. What we see per year uh, in the in our country, and India accounts for surprisingly one fourth of the total retinoblastoma uh, cases in the world. Uh, 
which is quite surprising and astonishing. So you should be aware how this disease uh, behaves and how we should manage these uh, patients. So almost 25% of these cases, unfortunately, present in an orbital uh, form. Orbital means the tumor is out of the globe of the eyeball. So that is called an orbital retinoblastoma. So advanced tumor at initial presentation continues to be a problem in our country. And that uh, is a problem to deal with these patients whenever we think about uh, the globe salvage. So retinoblastoma registry in India, you know, it's very difficult in our country to have this kind of uh, things. But fortunately, National Cancer Registry Program uh, it was established in 2012, almost eight years back. Uh, which uh, which involves population-based cancer registries uh, of five partners in the country and hospital-based cancer registries, which are 29. So approximately, the, they, they predict that there are 1,000 cases of male as well as female. That means almost 2,000 cases of retinoblastoma every year. So this is our paper published uh, in February 2019. Uh, uh, based on the epidemiology, there are no racial predilection, what we noticed, no sex predilection, no eye predilection, right and left are commonly or almost similar, mostly unilateral, which constitute around 65 to 70 percent, bilateral, unfortunately, are also quite high, almost one third of them are bilateral, what we have seen in our uh, series. Genetics are very important, uh, we should all know that it is uh, familial, but uh, unlike the belief that most of these are familial or hereditary, uh, most of them are sporadic. So hereditary nature was identified in 1962. Uh, Stellard uh, noted deletion of D chromosome, uh, chromosome 13, locus of deletion 14 band on the long arm of 13th chromosome was noticed. Intact gene protects patients from getting retinoblastoma. So the RB susceptible gene, which is RB1, is a tumor suppressor gene. And RB1 is an autosomal dominant gene. So RB to occur, both genes should be mutated. So I'll come a uh, little bit of more details uh, because some postgraduates are, uh, uh, are there in this uh, group. So what happens is you have a germline mutation and a somatic mutation. So germline mutation is the one which, trans which is transmitted from the parent to the, uh, to the inherit. It is inherited to the next generation. So the first RB mutation from mother or father and subsequently the patient passes on this RB mutation, whether he exhibits the disease or not, but he passes that mutation to his progeny again. So this offspring has an increased risk of developing retinoblastoma as this trait is transmitted as an autosomal dominant with high penetration of 90%. Does not mean that every patient who has got, who receives this gene will develop the disease. I'll come to that in a later, little later. So they also have a significant increased risk of secondary tumors. When you have an RB gene, RB1 gene mutated in your body, then you are prone to develop other malignancies. So you might have seen patients coming to you with an osteosarcoma and when you test the molecular status, some of them do find RB1 gene. So you have some other cancers, PNET, melanoma is also having RB1 gene. Sporadic retinoblastoma is in where there is no hereditary component here. Uh, the mutation happens after the childbirth in the somatic cell. So that means that these tumors automatically develop after birth, not related to their parents. And these, and you all know the somatic cells will not be uh, transmitted to their progeny. So the, in 1971, uh, Knudsen was the first to say, two heat hypothesis of tumorogenesis. The reason why this explanation is, was called for, when it is an autosomal dominant gene, when it transfers from parent to the child, why every child will not get the disease? So that explains here this double uh, two heat hypothesis. So one heat germinal mutation that affects all cells is transmitted from the parent to the child. There should be a second heat somatic in the retinal cells. So somatic mutation has to happen in this in the retinal cells of a newborn child. Then only you develop this disease that is called hereditary retinoblastoma. In other patients who, which are sporadic, that means which develops de novo, both heats happen in the somatic cells. So there is no hereditary component here. Both the somatic heats happen in the somatic cells. So there is no risk of second non-ocular tumors in these patients. 
they have only retinoblastomas they are not prone to develop second malignancies in the future they like osteosarcoma and other diseases so there is no risk of transmission if you have a sporadic and fortunately unlike the belief that the the retinoblastomas what we see commonly are all sporadic 95% of them are sporadic only 5% or less than 5% are familiar or hereditary so when you have an unilateral retinoblastoma 90% of them are non hereditary that means they are sporadic it happens de novo only 10 to 15% are hereditary if a patient has got a unilateral retinoblastoma but if the patient has got a bilateral retinoblastoma you should be more more often almost 95 to 99% of these patients are familial or hereditary that means the patients have got this disease transmitted from their parents so the pathogenesis uh, originally in uh, 1864 way back uh, they thought that the tumor severized from the glial cells hence they called it as glioma uh, in by virco in 1864 subsequently flexner and these are the two guys who believe that it is arising from the neuroepithelium and called them as uh, a retinoblast finally uh, it was accepted as retinoblastoma Way back in 1926 by American Ophthalmic Society. So this is how the disease is. You look at the uh, uh, massive tumor here with the fluid behind. This is called subretinal fluid in a cross section. You see the massive tumor here, and this is a gross uh, specimen of a enucleated retinoblastoma. So the pathology, uh, pathology is uh, uh, microscopically we divide them into uh, grade one and poorly differentiated. So well differentiated and poorly differentiated, and nothing, uh, nothing uh, we like intermediate here. So it's grade one, well differentiated, and classically you find rosettes and florets. First described by Flexner and Wintersteiner uh, way back in 1894, and uh, and poorly differentiated tumors you do not find this rosettes uh, formation in poorly differentiated tumors there are small round cells with large hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm so this you look at this uh, rosettes uh, formation rosettes and florets around the vessels around the uh, connective tissue uh, lo central lumen with the rosette formation plenty of this uh, rosettes and florets all over is a classical of retinoblastoma see you this, you see this so there is plenty of such around the vessels uh, the forming rosettes we call well differentiated flexner winterstein rosettes formation these are the poorly differentiated retinoblastoma large cells pleomorphic nuclei uh, so see, you see you don't find the rosettes very rarely you find rosettes here but most of them are highly poorly differentiated large cells with pleomorphic nuclei so this is one thing which is very very important i have seen some of our clinicians asking for a biopsy when they were asked to treat a patient of retinoblastoma so biopsy is in other words it's criminal you are seedling the intraocular tumor into an extraocular tumor by doing a biopsy so we do not expect a biopsy to be done in an intraocular retinoblastoma so diagnosis is purely clinical and no biopsy is required examination under anesthesia with extended ophthalmoscopy is required for uh, retinoblastoma diagnosis and staging entire thing is done by uh, ophthalmoscopy only today these days we have what you call in uh, ophthalmoscopy is done by a red cam this is a digital wide angle retinal imaging device uh, this makes it possible to capture the entire retina uh, from the ora serrata uh, so, so this uh, retinal photography is very very important for documentation education of the patient and family and for future comparison every 3 weeks every 6 weeks we do ophthalmoscopy and see if the tumor is responding or not so it is mandatory these days to have in ocular oncology department nowadays now this is the new thing which has come a red can mobile based one uh, this is a gadget which has got an uh, c arm uh, which you directly see the patient with your mobile and you can take a picture so now it is available and it just cost Eleven uh, thousand rupees. So uh, examination uh, is very very important. As I said, this is because basically diagnosis is made on this. So classically, it appears as one or multiple nodular white or cream-colored masses, often associated with increased vascularization. 
they can be endophytic and exophytic endophytic means the tumors are growing into the uh, uh, globe so the the one which we have shown here this is an endophytic tumor with a fluid developing on the back subretinal fluid so tumor grows anteriorly into the vitreous cavity whereas exophytic growth more posteriorly infiltrates into the retina choroid and goes into extra choroidal tissues so diagnosis is apart from the ophthalmoscopy you have an ultrasound you see the multiple tumors uh, within the globe and a ct scan and mri uh, is required uh, most of the times so ultrasound we call it as most often the b scan ultrasound is done it defines the height and thickness associated with retinal detachment and calcification are also can be identified by simple ultrasound it has got a very small probe and it is put on the temporal side of the uh, of, uh, child and then we do the ultrasound so these are hyper echoic masses with calcium and posterior shadowing on the b scan of the ultrasound this is classical of an ultrasound finding of retinoblastoma so and computer tomography uh, ct scan to demonstrate the presence or absence of the calcium most of the times you find the calcium deposits within the tumor and that also gives a size by doing a ct scan but uh, mostly we try to avoid ct scan because these are children uh, small children we do a mri scan under anesthesia to evaluate it also gives you more details of optic nerve involvement which is very very important very rarely it involves the bones so ct scan is not of great benefit so mri is the way to go extraocular extension and uh, also that if you have any changes in the brain csf uh, involvement meningeal involvement and the third retinoblastoma what you call it as trilateral retinoblastoma will accidentally be found especially in hereditary form of uh, retinoblastoma so mri is obviously preferred modality especially because these are kids bone marrow examination lumbar puncture are also are mandatory when the tumor is intraocular tumor is big when you call it as uh, group 4 or 5 or group d or e as per the latest classification uh, to rule out csf metastasis as well as bone marrow metastasis bone marrow involvement so we sometimes do have problems in the diagnosis by clinical examination there are so many other differential diagnoses but this is a rare phenomenon and most common what we have is a congenital cataract and a coarse disease which can mimic retinoblastoma now the clinical spectrum you'll be surprised to see uh, especially in india you have uh, from intraocular tumors to massive extraocular tumors especially people coming from the rural background so staging uh, basically uh, uh, we follow the new international staging system stage 0 is what we need to address uh, more often than the rest of the uh, stages stage 0 means the tumor is within the globe now stage 1 is also tumor within the globe but the, when when you are doing an enucleation you find microscopically there is no tumor outside the globe stage 2 is when you find microscopic disease outside the globe it is called stage 2 so you have stage 0 stage 1 and stage 2 for intraocular retinoblastoma stage 3 means there is an obvious on a ct on mr a tumor outside the globe it's called stage 3 and stage 3b is if you have a nodal disease in the preauricular or cervical node extension stage 4 is obviously metastatic disease either in the brain csf or in the bone or anywhere in the body the classical what we were when we were in medicine we were doing medicine we were taught about rees elsworth classification now the latest one is new international staging system followed throughout the world now this is the results classical uh, retinoblastoma you all know about it we used to look at disc diameters in the past group 1 to group 5 which is now converted into group a to group 5 group e so there is some there are some changes again based on the prognosis or the characteristics of each group varies by prognosis so group a is less than 3 mm in diameter is a group a which can be easily dealt by local therapy which is done by an ophthalmologist group b is also tumors which are more than 3 mm 
But if the tumor is even less than three millimeters, if it is near the macula, it is group B. When the tumor has got some amount of subretinal fluid, then also it becomes group B. And if you have subretinal seeds, which are small, tiny seeds behind the tumor, then you call it as group C. And you have vitreous seeds, which are in the center of the globe, then you also call it as group C when they are focal. But you have multiple seeds, uh, vitreous, whether it is subretinal or in the vitreous, it is group D. And group E is a massive tumor filling the 50% of the globe with hemorrhage, neovascularization, glaucoma, extension into the anterior chamber. We call it as group E. This is, this is the latest international grouping of intraocular tumors. And we all follow this internationally. I'm proud to say that we started the department way back in 2003 when we were sporadically getting cases from now and from different parts of the country. We thought, why don't we have a specialized ocular oncology services at LV Prasad Eye Hospital in association with Apollo Cancer Institute. In 2003, when we started this, uh, now the referrals have increased. Now we are almost treating 200, 200 plus patients every year, new patients. So at any given point of time, we have around 600 to 800 patients on treatment uh, at, at Hyderabad. So this is our own data, which we published in 2020 recently in International Ophthalmology Journal of uh, 2000 odd uh, eyes with 1,457 patients. So 836 patients had unilateral and 622 had bilateral. Uh, normally there are only 15% of them are bilateral, but if you look at here, it's almost 40%. That's because the, we are a tertiary care center Patients with bilateral disease, people cannot manage, so they refer it to us. So we have more number of bilateral patients in our institute. So looking at this, uh, if you look at the uh, most of the patients are, they fall in less than five years age group. Almost 90% of them are less than five years age group. This is our own data. Again, you look at the uh, between uh, two and uh, between one to four years, you find most of the patients in uh, retinoblastoma. Now, most common uh, symptom is leukophoria. That means the uh, white reflex, whatever you call uh, white reflex, the simplest, easiest way to diagnose a patient of retinoblastoma. You see a photograph uh, when they are uh, done for a birthday, you see a glow inside like a white pearl, uh, white cauliflower thing that is seen within the center part of the eye. So the commonest symptom is uh, white reflex or leukophoria. leukophoria and uh, uh, tumor location intraocular uh, is 90% in our series and only 10% of extraocular tumors uh, in 2074 is what we have our data. So, and most of the patients unfortunately fall into group D and which originally called as uh, group four and group five. Now international classification is group D and D. This is most of the patients. If you look at 70%, 75% of them fall into group D and D. That is the challenging area that we need to salvage the globe, uh, save the life and vision and the globe. So coming to the management, uh, I think that's a brief introduction and we have covered almost uh, yeah half an hour. So, right. So let us uh, uh, so start on the principles of management. Very rarely some of the tumors can have uh, spontaneous regression, very small tumors. We can uh, do local therapy and observe some of them in the next follow-up, they disappear. The priorities of the treatment of retinoblastoma, we should remember, we should save the life. That is utmost prior priority. Next is to preserve the globe and possible vision. So in that specific order. So minimizing side effects is also is very, very important because we know that we are dealing with the small children who are less than five years. So saving the life, preserving the eye, that's the globe and salvage the function of the eye that is optimal vision if possible. So what we see, which are only 10 to 15% of the patients come in group A and B, that is just a small areas of less than three millimeters in size tumors. They are dealt by ophthalmologists alone by doing local therapy, cryotherapy, thermotherapy, or laser coagulation. We'll talk briefly about these three therapies that is done by the ophthalmologist. So cryotherapy is a very good form of uh, eradicating the disease. 
locally, but it gives a big scar. So that is a disadvantage of cryotherapy. So this part of the area we lose the vision. Photocoagulation is another best way of doing or uh, I mean, uh, reducing the tumor. But again, this also leaves a lot of uh, scarring and you lose the vision in that part of the retina. So now the latest and the most commonly used therapy is called thermotherapy, transpupillary thermotherapy. This is the best way to treat the patients and this is a very local, good, good local therapy and this causes very minimal scarring. So this is an area where we, uh, we come into play as an oncologist uh, uh, to treat uh, group three, group four, which is now called as group C and group D. Uh, so the chemo reduction, local therapy, plaque bracket therapy, external beam radiation, all these things fall in this category. This is an area where we need to save the life, globe and the vision. So once they become late in any way, you're going to inoculate. So, so this is an area where we need to focus on where these patients can be salvaged with the globe and vision. So let us talk about chemo reduction first. So most commonly these patients have to go for chemo reduction because most of these patients come into group D and group E category where we need to preserve the eye and the globe and the vision. So what does chemo does? It reduces the tumor burden and it allows the ophthalmologist to do local therapy. So it's a huge tumor becoming smaller and then you do local thermotherapy, then you clear the issue. And then every three weeks you follow it up and see how it is and if you have new crops coming up or the old lesion is decreasing or not, we need to see very, very carefully and then the local therapies would take care if they are very small, it doesn't require further treatment. So it makes the job of the, of the, of the ophthalmologist easier by receiving chemotherapy, the tumors become smaller. Sometimes the tumor is sitting right on the macula and you can't do thermotherapy. So you do chemotherapy, it becomes, it becomes smaller, it can move away from the macula, then you do thermotherapy. The standard chemotherapy uh, now present day treatment is VEC, uh, vincristine adipocyte and carboplatin. These are the standard doses which are available on the net. You don't need to get into those details. Uh, these are very well tolerated uh, by the kids. Uh, in some centers, we use it for three weeks interval. In some centers, we use it for four weeks interval. It's only because the child coming from a distant places becomes difficult for them to come back every three weeks, so it can be postponed to four weeks. But nevertheless, the recovery of the children is very fast. You can as well do it in every three weeks. So chemotherapy can be used as a new adjuvant chemotherapy in group D and E, large tumors. We are not doing local therapy. You do only chemotherapy and then uh, do focal therapy after three cycles or six cycles of chemotherapy. Concurrent, which we call it as sequential aggressive local therapy, wherein we do chemotherapy and local therapy simultaneously. The patient is taken up for UUA and you look at the tumor, you do thermotherapy and the patient comes to the chemotherapy ward and then we do chemotherapy. The whole idea is that when you do local therapy, there will be a lot of inflammation increased vasculature, so the chemotherapy drugs reach that area faster and in more concentration. So that's an idea of doing local therapy followed by chemotherapy in most of the centers. Then adjuvant chemotherapy, this is after enucleation, which will come to you later. This is a classical case of massive tumor uh, before chemotherapy and after chemotherapy. Before chemotherapy and after chemotherapy. So this is an again a chemotherapy alone, large tumors, uh, and then coming out of the macula, and then you can do local therapy. This is an, again a big tumor which is sitting right on the macula, and this can be reduced in size, which is reduced in size, and then you do local therapy. So all this group C, group D, when you use chemo reduction and do focal therapy, you're almost able to get 83% of these cases completely regressed with chemo reduction and focal therapy. So that means you are able to 90% of these eyes can be salvaged by doing this therapy. So the advantage of chemo reduction is allows salvage of the eye, maximize potential for residual vision, possibly prevent systemic meds and delays and prevents penileoblastoma, which is also called as trilateral retinoblastoma. So what do you do when you have a recurrent or residual or resistant retinoblastoma? So what happens in these cases and refractory cases there? It is very, very important to refer these patients to higher centers, tertiary care centers, 
where you do all kinds of high end treatments in these patients without losing a hope so we do high dose chemotherapy intravenous intra arterial chemotherapy periocular chemotherapy intraocular chemotherapy and salvage gbrt so any of these based on individual necessity you can look at it and look at the options feasibilities and uh, we can do this kind of treatment let us come to each one of us slowly this is a periocular chemotherapy you see that uh, it's a direct injection subtenon injection which is given uh, uh, just below the tenon capsule uh, uh, just above the uh, sclera and they and they respond uh, very you see that 70% i salvage can be done versus not giving chemotherapy uh, in these patients versus 30% now intravitreal chemotherapy when you have vitreous seeds which are not responding to standard treatment that means intravenous chemotherapy may not reach vitreous uh, cavity so we do intravitreal chemotherapy uh, which in a recurrent cases and when the vitreous seeds are not responding and the doses are uh, we drugs are used are melphalan and topotecan and the doses you can get it uh, uh, in the uh, 22 to 40 micrograms at what we use uh, just 0.4 uh, 0.04 ml that what we use by directly injecting the needle uh, by the side of uh, the limbus into the vitreal cavity this is which is uh, very very interesting and very gratifying results what we uh, just started uh, three years uh, back and uh, we are happy to share our experience uh, this is called intra arterial chemotherapy either you do triple drug or two drugs melphalan topotecan and carboplatin the doses mentioned here and these are the areas that briefly i'll show, uh, show you the video and this is the intraarterial chemotherapy, chemotherapy which is similar to uh, the angiogram uh, that what we do for the cath lab which is done in the cath lab the abdominal artery prior to the procedure a nasal decongestant oxymetazoline is administered to reduce the blood supply to the nasal passages After the induction of general anesthesia, femoral artery access is obtained and intravenous heparin is administered. Utilizing fluoroscopic guidance, a four French guide catheter is advanced into the, the common carotid artery and then the from the there you get into the internal carotid and you pass through that uh, thing. Under roadmap guidance, you a see, micro catheter you is that, advanced uh, over a microwire. This is the ophthalmic artery. artery. You go up and then while pushing, pulling it down, it suddenly gets into the while while Selected you pull it down of the abdominal artery slowly pull it down by slowly retracting the microcatheter and then you see the that it suddenly gets origin. into the that's it so that's the area and you hold it there super selective and angiography <coughs> is then performed you inject the, the drug the microcatheter and assess the hemodynamic and this is the, flow patterns the, uh, of the, abdominal the difficult artery. part you need to have patients and each drug has to go infuse for 20 minutes Melphalan so you are staying in the cath lab for 60 minutes three drugs 20 minutes each and you have to give it for one hour position is assessed during the infusion by intermittent fluoroscopy so this is how it is uh, done and this is our own uh, patient you see the internal carotid artery you pass the catheter above and while pulling it down that slips into the ophthalmic artery and then you do inject the drugs through this this is how this another patient you see the ophthalmic artery in some patients they are quite thick and it's easier in some patients it's very thin and it's very difficult so this is an ophthalmic artery and this is a catheter and that is pushed into the ophthalmic artery and then only you inject the drugs this is the orbit and this is a, you see the gush inside the orbit that means intense concentration of this drugs directly into the tumor so this is another patient and you see the gush after you do the injection so this is sometimes in uh, 90% of the times we do inter internal carotid artery but sometimes if we uh, sometimes if you don't find a ophthalmic artery uh, properly then you do through the external carotid artery through the uh, middle meningeal artery from the external carotid artery you go into the middle meningeal artery and get into the temporal artery go through the temporal artery as distal as possible and then inject the dry so and in inject the drug so this is how the gush happens inside the orbit so these are the multiple retinoblastoma 
um, uh, patient uh, scans and you see uh, an ultrasound images, the massive tumor before and then after one cycle and you see after second cycle and after third cycle. These patients have to be mentally prepared and counseled for three doses of uh, intra-arterial chemotherapy once in three weeks. So this is before and after. So this is how dramatic responses we see with intra-arterial chemotherapy. So we have uh, done uh, uh, in 124 uh, patients uh, and then you look at each patient three times. So it's around 330 cycles. Bilateral cases, three cases. Intra -carotid, internal carotid artery is 90%. Ex through external carotid artery is less than 10%. So this is done at Apollo Cancer Institute, Hyderabad. Uh, so then you come to plaque bracket therapy. Last time we did, did discuss very uh, extensively on plaque bracket therapy, so I'll be brief on that. So indications in retinoblastoma would be chemo reduction failure or when there is a recurrence. Rarely as a primary treatment. That you should understand that this is not a primary uh, method of treating the patients. But the tumor has to be less than 60 millimeters diameter and less than 8 millimeters thickness because we use most often ruthenium bracket therapy. And the dose, as you all know, 4,000 to 5,000 centigrade and 90% success rate is what we see in these tumors. So commonly used are in the country, in our country or across the globe are iodine and ruthenium. Uh, iodine has got uh, gamma rays and it's very difficult. Uh, you need a lot of protection in the theater as well as in the patient isolation. So ruthenium is safest and easiest and the best. And also major advantage of ruthenium is the half-life is one year. So you don't need to change the source so often, so we do it once in two years. Now, the good news is that the, we used to buy ruthenium from outside where Germany. Now we are getting the uh, prepared at our own center in DRC. And so we are very, very happy. And not only that, uh, that this is affordable. And if you look at 11 lakhs, what we used to spend earlier, now it is only 50,000. And whoever wants to start, the BRC is ready to give free of cost for the first plaque to any of these institutes who want to take up this. And this is absolutely quality assurance has been done. Uh, we, we formed a team in the country uh, for the development of this plaque and we are very, very happy that we got out our indigenous plaque in India. And this is uh, gone through multiple uh, um, quality assurances. And finally, uh, the first case has been done at Hyderabad uh, on August 21st, 2019. We are very, very proud that we could use our Indian uh, and this is a quality assurance from all angles, horizontal, vertical, and the V-plane, and the H-plane, the dose distribution. This is compared with the B-big plaque, ruthenium plaque from the Germany. It's 100% matching with the, uh, the source which we used to buy from outside. So how does this procedure happen? So, uh, black bracket therapy uh, is first you do the uh, tumor dimensions, either by an ultrasound, sometimes by a CT scan or an MRI scan. And then you draw it on the retinal diagram, which is on the computer and the dosimetry screen. And then the plaque can be placed according to, and we can move it with the mouse and then put it according to the area of the tumor and we get a dosimetry. And then after doing the computer planning, then we take up for the uh, placement. We call it as conjectiva. Conjectiva is cut by the side of the limbus. Uh, it's called conjectival peritomy. And then this is a dummy plaque. This dummy plaque is placed inside first. Uh, and then we do an ultrasound to make sure that the dummy plaque is right on the tumor. Then the ruthenium plaque in the red country is removed and placed exactly where the dummy plaque is played. And we look at the, we already, uh, with the dummy plaque, we mark an eye here. And this is the area which, which matches with the ruthenium plaque here. And then we suture it from here uh, from uh, to this this eye to this area, uh, which is exactly the same as the dummy plaque where we placed it earlier. Once this is, so you look at the suture being uh, uh, placed here uh, to this uh, black mark, which is placed earlier. And then the conjunctive is sutured and the patient is kept in, a, uh, kept in an isolation for the required amount of time as per the dose calculation. Now the proper uh, care is taken and then plaque is removed after the exposure time. Uh, sometimes under local anesthesia, we can remove it. So the patient uh, is asked to come after four to six, six weeks to see the response and two thirds of the patients have 
uh, are known to have a complete response. Ninety percent of them would have look uh, response, but sixty-five percent of them would have complete response. This is pre and post plaque brachytherapy, and this is the a patient uh, is the first patient which was done in two thousand two. I'm so glad this patient has been advised enucleation. A bilateral retinoblastoma of one eye is already enucleated. The other eye was supposed to get enucleated, and they had come to us. And I'm glad that this guy is uh, uh, in 2015 uh, years later. You look at this is a processes, and this is a normal eye, and he's still alive with a normal, complete control of the disease. So, black brachytherapy in our cases, we have done 232 plus cases uh, at Hyderabad and uh, you will melanomas, uh, retinoblastoma, different uh, tumors have got different doses. And retinoblastoma, as I said, two thirds of the patients would have responses with this tumor. So briefly about external beam radiation in uh, intraocular retinoblastomas, uh, salvage EBRT only in refractory cases, not as a primary modality of treatment in retinoblastomas. So when all other modalities fail, then only you think about external beam radiation. So intraocular retinoblastoma, role of external beam radiation is very minimal. Only after the primary treatments are exhausted and there is resistance of disease, then you do uh, external beam radiation to the intraocular tumors. Extraocular retinoblastoma, any way you require radiation, we'll come to that in the next few slides. So salvage EBRT tumors with retinoblast RB gene mutations appear to be more sensitive. So bilateral retinoblastomas respond better than unilateral retinoblastoma. Should keep this in mind. Most of the times you try to enucleate when you have a bilateral retinoblastoma. So you can give a fair trial of external beam radiation in these patients. So likelihood of salvage is almost 67 to 83% in these patients with external beam radiation. So external beam radiation still has to be the last option, is avoided as much as possible because of facial deformity and because of second cancer, especially in hereditary type and bilateral retinoblastomas. So most of the, all these patients have to be treated under anesthesia. And you can look at this 2D external beam radiation. We take a lateral film and then based on the film, we do a styrofoam cutter and design a lead block. And you see the lead blocks, anterior part of the shielding is complete. And posterior part is the shape of the eyeball. This is anterior beam block posteriorly. Part of the optic nerve is treated. This is how the beam is designed. And bilateral retinoblastoma can also be treated with this lead blocks if it is a 2D. And then we can design, we have, we, we can, way back, we earlier used to treat with 2D. And you see the pencil beam block we used to design and then treat these patients with the pencil beam block uh, in those days. Now with 3D CRT also, this is the, uh, uh, the CTV volume of the uh, globe intraocular retinoblastoma, the entire eyeball behind oroserata. So you have to draw the CTV behind the lens, behind the oroserata, up to one centimeter of the optic nerve. So this is the entire globe, one centimeter of the optic nerve behind the oroserata should be your clinical target volume. And a post-operative orbital retinoblastoma, that means the tumor is already out of the eyeball. Then you have to include the entire orbit, optic canal, as well as the ipsilateral cavernous sinus. So this is how the CTV volume of the orbital RB has to be done. Now, IMRT EBT planning, this is very important because you need to have a target volume in these patients. When you have a post-operative case, entire orbit, optic canal, ipsilateral cavernous sinus, uh, <clears throat> inferior orbital fissure and superior orbital fissure. Whereas for the intact, there's intraocular retinoblastoma, the CTV is entire eyeball behind aura serrata. That means you are sparing the cornea and the lens, and then up to one centimeter of the optic nerve. So in the lateral view, a CTV volume. And this is how, end of the day, after you treat retinoblastoma, intraocular retinoblastoma with IMRT, cornea and lens sparing IMRT. So you have a bilateral retinoblastoma also. It is safe that you can treat this kind of patients with, with the latest technology. What we have, volumetric arc therapy, Entire eyeball behind the oracerate up to one centimeter of optic nerve. In a single go, we can treat. And this is for the ophthalmic uh, people who have logged in. This is easy for the, for the radiation oncologist to treat. You see how the patient is being treated. Two globes in one single go in 1.2 minutes. Both the globes 
and the result is like this. So you see the anterior part of the eyeball is uh, spayed, cornea uh, and the lens are spayed and the entire globe with one centimeter of the optic nerve is treated bilaterally in a single go. So one thing would, that we should remember that these children, uh, we should keep the eyes open to reduce the dose to the cornea. Uh, wise, eyes should be wide open. You cut open the, on the cut open the immobilization device uh, if the patient is unconscious or in anesthesia, you plaster the eyelids up and below onto the onto the aquaplast and keep the eyes open. Radiation sequelae in this uh, era, the we all understand these are mega voltage, so the re reactions are very less. And these days we do lacrimal gland sparing, IMRT, so the dryness also is very uh, uh, less frequent. Lens is not an issue. You might develop a cataract at a later date, and that can be possible to extract it. And the cornea, we hardly get keratitis because the doses what we deliver for retinoblastoma is 45 gray, and cornea can tolerate up to that. With and also with the open eyes, we hardly get such kind of doses. So retina and optic nerve also can tolerate reasonable good doses, and this is how uh, we are safely can deliver these uh, things. And finally, on the enucleation part, uh, once the tumor is uh, um, not salvageable with any kind of these refractory retinoblastomas or group E, that means group 5 tumors, massive tumors uh, with hemorrhage and all. So those kind of tumors have to go for enucleation and what happens then? However, the enucleation rates have significantly come down that, uh, in the recent times and enucleation is done only in a secondary glaucoma when the, there is anterior segment involvement and seedling happens and worse eye in an advanced bilateral retinoblastoma. We should all remember that enucleation is not the end of the treatment. It is just the beginning. We need to look at the pathological parameters to get the cure rates in these patients. Very, very important. So when you have an anterior chamber infiltration or trabecular meshwork infiltration, ciliar body infiltration or choroid infiltration, or if the optic nerve is invaded or exclusive infiltration is there, then you also need to add radiation treatment in these patients. Otherwise, all these patients would go for adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is anterior uh, chamber infiltration, iris ciliar body infiltration, and these tumors, and this is an optic nerve infiltration. These tumors certainly would require, see, you look at the most, most common involvement is optic nerve. These are the high risk factors, optic nerve and uh, choroidal invasion. So these tumors need to be given adjuvant treatment. And you will see, 52% of these patients who undergo enucleation would have high risk factors. So these patients would certainly require chemotherapy six cycles when you have uh, extraocular extension or optic nerve transaction, then it goes on to 12 cycles of high dose chemotherapy and sandwiching radiation after six cycles. So that is how uh, these patients, then only you get uh, the results what we are showing, 90, 95% survival rates. So when you have optic nerve invasion or scleral extraocular extension, then you require external beam radiation as well, apart from 12 cycles of high dose chemotherapy. Does adjuvant therapy help? Certainly. So if you do not do adjuvant treatment, 24% of these patients, this is again our own data, 24% of these patients would have metastasis or local recurrence. Only 4% 4, 4 that is 2 uh, patients had metastasis when you receive adjuvant treatment. Stage 3 retinoblastoma, earlier we used to do directly excentration. The mortality is to be almost 70 to 90 percent. Now the latest protocol is you start with new adjuvant chemotherapy, high dose VEC protocol, then, then only you do enucleation and then you do orbital EBRT, external beam radiation to the entire orbit, the volumes which I already mentioned, then continue high dose chemotherapy for 12 cycles. Then the mortality from 70% increases to survival to 70% in this orbital retinoblastoma. Such massive tumors have a gratifying responses with chemotherapy, do enucleation, radiation, and then put processes. And this is a child with processes. So massive tumors respond dramatically with this chemotherapy. So basically, if you look at the treatment modalities, you look at systemic chemotherapy, 60% of them would certainly get chemotherapy and still you get 35% of them going for enucleation 
because majority of them come in very late stages. So orbital adenoblastoma and group E patients have to go, we can save their lives, but we have to go for enucleation. In a metastatic RB, uh, CSF positive patients, then we do intrathecal chemotherapy. We start with intrathecal single drug methotrexate and four doses and then do CSF analysis. And if it works out well and the CSF becomes negative, you do two more doses as a consolidation. After four weeks of methotrexate, if you still have CSF positivity, we change that into triple drug chemotherapy for another four doses of methotrexate, cytosol, and hydrocortisone. But in advanced cases of intracranial extension, metastatic bone, we do high dose chemotherapy, but that will become palliative only. None of these patients can be salvaged, can be cured. We can only control the disease for some time, give palliative CT and RT or supportive symptomatic treatment. I have never seen a patient surviving with the metastatic disease. So these have dismal prognosis. So it is quite gratifying after we started this uh, uh, new uh, dedicated uh, ocular oncology department. You see the results from various centers. Now the results with our centers on par with international standards. Almost 90, 95% of these patients, this was a data of 1,000 patients, 95% of them, and these are 1,450 patients, 92% of them are alive and well. So that is what is very, very important. We are able to salvage 92% of these patients in from stage one to stage three. So follow-up is very, very important as we all know uh, because new tumor formation is quite common even after getting complete remission, these patients can get up new crops of disease. We need to understand that and we should be very, very careful in following up these patients till the age of four years. So evaluation under anesthesia need to continue. When you do local therapy or any kind of focal therapy, you need to follow them up and you should be very, very careful. Even after complete remission, we ask these patients to come every six to eight weeks till the age of four to see if there is any local recurrence and we immediately salvage them with local therapy. So patients with hereditary retinoblastoma, they have increased high risk of secondary malignancies. That we should keep it in mind. Most common are osteosarcoma, PNATs, fibrosarcoma, and melanomas. Especially when these patients undergo with radiation, they almost have 70 to 80% chance of developing second malignancies, especially in the area of the radiation especially when the RB gene is mutated. So long-term follow-up of these patients is mandatory with a special vigilance for patients with a germinal mutation. Overall outcome, overall survival, as we mentioned, this is our own data. So we are really, really proud of having a tertiary care center here. And overall survival is 92%. 36% of these eyes still needed enucleation. 55% of these eyes undergo enucleation you should remember that 55% of these patients, of these 36%, do require adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation to get that 92% survival. Chemo reduction and salvage of the eye is 90% when you use chemotherapy. So in an Indian scenario, unfortunately, you still have 80 to 85% patients in a primary care, primary and healthcare center. So the results are very poor. Only 50% mortality is what we are noticing. But if this, these kind of patients come to centers where there are dedicated treatments available, where you can do the protocol-based management, then the results will be almost 90%. What is important is a good tandem between uh, uh, coordination and understanding between ophthalmologists and radiation oncologists working together in tandem. That makes a huge sense. You are discussing in and out uh, which is better first, which is later. So what kind of treatment need to be done in that particular patient are very, very important to get the best results and to work as a team. So bilateral retinoblastoma, one of these patients is, she comes for our uh, cancer survivor program. She sings uh, songs and uh, we're so glad that she's a teenager now. Uh, so bilateral retinoblastoma, we could save her life and vision. So chemo radiation make the difference in retinoblastomas, and we all know that the eyes are the most important, one of the most important organs in the uh, body, and we need to protect them. Thank you very much for the late evening, and thanks for not yawning, although it almost took one hour.
class. I'm glad that uh, uh, that you could have so much of patience to listen to me. Thank you very, very much.